Hey everybody, welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. It's Tom, Motorista LLC, here in not so sunny Braden in Florida, overcast. Supposed to get some storms coming in on Saturday, so, and they're supposed to be strong. Hopefully I don't lose a, a tree or something. That would suck. And I got a lot of trees, so anyway, enough wood talk. If we want to talk about wood, we're going to go elsewhere. So right now, I guess we should stop right there. I'm going to go over some things in regards to putting these carbs back together. This should not be a terribly long video, hopefully. Uh, because I'm just going to summarize a few things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up these carb kits and I'm going to explain uh, what they are, where they're from, why I went this way as far as getting all this stuff, you know, from two different sources as the case may be, and then go over what to look for when you got a, an aftermarket kit and, you know, what you should use and what you shouldn't use. Because, like, I think I mentioned in another video of these carbs that some of these kits are just junk. I don't suspect that's the case here, but we'll find out. So let's start with the first one. This is from the gentleman I mentioned, uh, v4dreams.com. And I ordered some stuff from him, so I'm going to very carefully just cut the top edge of this off. you got to do that when you open these packages up because you could have a float bowl gasket laying right there. And then you cut through it, and good night, Irene. I can tell right now this is going to be a pretty good one because it's got Motion Pro fuel line. And I did order that part of it, you know, that, uh, you know, he, he sells it in kind of, you know, different add-ons from the basic kit. There are some instructions. We're going to go over those here in a minute. So this is very similar to what you find in uh, the kits for the Valkyrie from Red Eye Technical. All right, so let's take a look at what we got. These are carb bowl gaskets. Now, they are not formed uh, like you typically see in a you know, carburetor float bowl gasket as far as the shape goes. These you just kind of put in there, and I'll kind of give you an idea here on one of these guys here in a little bit. And some other uh, O-rings, and I, honestly, i got to look at the order. I've ordered so much stuff for this thing and other, uh, other you know, customer work and so forth over the last couple of weeks. I can't even remember, but pretty sure these are, yeah, these are the joint O-rings. We're probably, we may use these and we may not. And I'll explain that here in a second. I mean, we've got a couple pieces of fuel line, which um, will go uh, off your fuel tees and, or be, I'm sorry, between the fuel tee and one rack of carbs and then between the other one. And then that T is where the fuel pump inlet goes. And then some, uh, some band clamps here for the um, spring clamps, rather, for the lines. Pretty nice. That's all I got from them. Thought it was more, but I guess not. And as far as the instructions go, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he just kind of goes over cleaning and goes over uh, how to put them back together and do things like that. I kind of know how to do that already, but if you order from v4dreams.com, definitely read through here. I will read through it anyway off camera another time just to see if there's any pearls of information that I didn't even think of. And float bowl gasket replacement. He goes over that and using a dental type pick or a tiny screwdriver, pry out, pry out the old gasket, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to cover that too in addition to what you can do to take and clean the float bowl gasket properly. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at these. These are from Niche Cycle, N-I-C-H-E, in St. Petersburg, right up the road. I'm not sure why this box is bigger than the others, but we'll find out. This is where I got the entire nut from, and, and, and again, I'll explain why I did this separately in a minute. So this one comes with jets, emulsion, needle for the slide diaphragm, the whole bit, all right? So it has apparently two different main jets, depending on what you have. It has the gaskets for the, I'm sorry, the O-rings for the fuel tees, springs. This small one's most likely the O-ring for the pilot screw, which we need. And the other four, the other three rather, should be exactly the same. Not sure why. The, oh no, it is. I'm sorry, it is. It's it's pretty much the same. Okay, just in a different box. So one, two, buckle my shoe, yada yada, and we uh, be our F750F carb repair kit. I stumbled across these. I use Niche Cycle a lot for jets when I'm doing a custom tune since they're close by, A, and B, they have a really good website for both Makini and Cahin Jets. And I've ordered a bunch of jets from them over the last few years. I stumbled across this by just doing a Google search on the Google machine, 
and it turns out that they have these as well, and so I bought four. I don't remember how much they were. Uh, send me a message in the comment section if you want me to look it up for you, otherwise I'm not going to do it. All right, so we've got car parts here. Now, we're going to take a look at one of these because it has the jets in it. We're going to go over a few things in regards to what to look for when you are buying something that comes with jets and things like that. First thing I look for is, is the jet numbered? Now that may seem like, well, aren't all of them? And the answer to that is no. When you buy some aftermarket kits, the jets are not numbered. A lot of them are at least. These are 38s. These are the correct slow jets for this. And let's take a look at one of these main jets. And that is numbered as well. This one is a, oh, I can't, it's hard to read. Can you read that? This says 125, that's too big. And this one is 118. 118 is the stock jet. So it does come with a stock size and it comes with an oversized one. So the first thing you want to do is you take a look at a, like a pilot jet and if there's no number on it, be suspect. And I'm going to show you one of those because I have a few that I've kept uh, from other kits and not used and I'll show you what I mean by that. Here's a little dainty pilot jet from probably like a little Honda or something and uh, for the life of me I don't see any number marked into it whatsoever. So this was from an aftermarket kit uh, that uh, was for model specific, maybe from eBay, Amazon, whatever. And I never trust these. Now if you're throwing together something like a lawn mower or you know a little Briggs engine or something like that then you know obviously wouldn't have a jet like this most likely but you know you can use these in that application but something like this multi-carb that uh, they're a pain in the ass to get out they're a pain in the ass to get back in I'm not going to use anything that's unmarked and so these are marked may use them may not because the pilots that I have that um, I cleaned are in really good shape Another thing you want to do is when you put one of these uh, pilots in from a kit, if you so choose to use it, you need to put these in very carefully because sometimes when you put these in, they don't fit. And if you think they fit and you're going to go right for the money shot, then you could really screw up the carb real bad. So what I do is I want to just kind of test fit these and see if it binds at all. These are definitely the right thread. So I may use them. I don't know yet. I'm going to decide on that later on. So that's another thing you want to do. I have had that happen to me more than once where I have gotten an aftermarket kit that's supposed to be for a particular bike and or carburetor and I go to put the replacement jets in which are marked. You know they have the appropriate number on them and they don't fit. You know if I, if I drop another thing here I'm just going to scream because uh, my back is pretty screwed up and I'm trying to not bend down like that too much. In this kit, unlike the one from V4 Dreams because I don't think he carries it, I have the needle seat for the float and the needle. We will be using these from this kit. That was the main reason why I got this. So let's talk about that. Why did I source out from a couple of different places? And the main reason is, number one, I always go OEM first for something for myself in particular or for a customer's rig where they want that. If it's a customer says budget is fine, aftermarket is fine, then I do that. But 9 out of 10 times I go OEM for those as well. But certainly for my stuff, I go OEM on carb parts. So I took a look at the parts fish for these carbs and not everything was available. Um, a lot of stuff they just didn't have and it list, was listed as unavailable. Not even like, uh, you know, ships in 18 million years or something. It was simply unavailable. And I don't remember which one it was or parts. So in that case, I got to start searching aftermarket. And a lot of times you will find that um, the aftermarket kits don't have everything. At least they don't look like they have everything. And when I stumbled across uh, V4 Dreams here, yeah, he's in uh, Antioch, Illinois. Um, I, uh, I saw that he has some really good quality stuff. The guy has a website. He explains everything. So the guy's into the V4s, or at least the VFRs, I guess. And nice Viton. I most likely use these float bowl gaskets and assortment of parts in here. So on a job like this where I can't get all OEM parts and I need to, um, you know, come up with something uh, where I have to source it a couple of different places, I will pick and choose from the parts that I get in 
uh, and I will put the carbs back, back together in the best manner that I see the you know as far as the parts go. So I'm going to do the best job I can with the selection of parts that I think is the best in summary. And so th that's what I'm going to do with this. Yes, it's a little bit more money because you're duplicating. But I have found also because I do this, you know, on a lot of different bikes that when I save parts from other kits and I label them as to where they go, um, especially if it's another Honda bike, I have found more than more times than I can uh, even estimate that I've been able to use O-rings and uh, little seals or something like that out of these kits on the unused parts on another bike that I'm working on that I either don't have a kit for A or B. Um, it doesn't need a full kit. It just needs a couple of small things. So this is going to be stock, whatever is left over from this and or that, that I will save and use on something else in the future. The key here is organization and cataloging. All right, so let's talk about the float bowls because I mentioned that in the instructions. We're going to go over that first, and then we're going to go over a couple things in a carb body. All right, so the float bowls, I already ran these through the ultrasonic once. Uh, what you want to do with the float bowls is, before you start cleaning them, definitely take the drain valve, or the drain screw rather, out. And the reason is, you can get crud down inside there that you don't see. And so even if you just left it in and said, ah, nothing's going to be in there, and then you go to put this back together, uh, just from the actions of, you know, handling the carburetor and putting fuel into it and fuel out and maybe doing some, some cursory cleaning with some carb clean on the inside of the carb, you partially break loose some crap that's inside that hole, and then you put it back together, and next thing you know, a piece of that crap migrates up into the float, uh, the uh, pilot, I'm sorry, the, the pilot jet, and then uh, then you got a problem, you got to take carb apart again because it ain't running right because you got no low end on that carb. So always, I always take these out before I clean. Number two, I want you to take a look at these carbs in regards to the drains and this little boss right here. Um, this is where in a different carburetor a standoff would be, you know, like a little copper or a brass tube actually that sticks up. And what that does is it prevents an overflow situation into the carb where, let's say the carb's sitting like this, which it kind of would be at an angle. Uh, if the if it was a gravity feed, I would think that these probably would come with it. Uh, but since it's a fuel pump, it's not a big deal. I'll explain it here in a second. Uh, if you had a gravity feed and a, and a uh, what do you call it, a fuel cock, fuel switch, whatever you want to call it, you know, fuel shutoff valve that failed and it was bypassing, um, you could overpower or overcome the float um, uh, valve itself and the floats, putting pressure on that valve. And you, will, you fill up the carburetor without an overflow like this. It's just going to come out inside the carburetor. And if you have the, if this intake valve is open, it's going to fill the motor up with gas. It's just inevitable. It's going to happen. Now, on a VFR and some other motorcycles with fuel pumps, it's not a big issue because it's virtually impossible for the pressure coming out, a gravity pressure coming out of a fuel tank to bypass a fuel pump and then make it upstream, which it is upstream. It's uphill into that carburetor to do it, which is most likely, ergo, why they don't have these. Now you can absolutely install these if you know what you're doing and you have a way to fix these up and then you want to, you can drill them real straight, you can press in a nice piece of tubing uh, or make something like I have before, I've made them before, I have a video on doing that and uh, it's all, and then you just have to figure out what the height would be and that's kind of a trial and error thing, but there are ways to do that too. But anyway, I'm not going to do that. We don't need to do that. I just wanted to kind of bounce it off you. The second thing is in cleaning this groove. When you clean these grooves, you really want to stay away from using a screwdriver, anything steel, because you don't want to scratch the bottom of that. Uh, now, if you scratch it a little bit, probably not a big deal. But here's the, here's the thing. Um, there is not a whole lot of tolerance in as far as pressure goes on these float bowl gaskets. Uh, against in this groove against the float body not a whole lot and if you put a gouge in here that's a potential for it to leak and it's not hard to do so um, I can refer you to the red eye technical information again and he actually provides a little plastic pick which for the life of me I don't remember where I put the one I have but I have another one out in the shed and a kit out there I can dig out but it doesn't really matter you want to try to use something soft as much as possible. Plastic would be the first choice. That doesn't work. Then get a little piece of brass. For example, you could take an old jet like this and uh, you know squeeze the end down in a vise 
and then file it so it's just under the width of this uh, slot and very carefully use that. Unfortunately, brass is a little bit, um, depending on the grade, of course, is, is, is the, certainly equal to or a little bit harder than the aluminum, but it's better than steel. And then other other thing you can do is take one of these tubes that are on boing on like, a, you know, your WD-40 or your carb cleaner, and you just kind of cut it at an angle and make a point, and you can kind of get in here and dig around. Uh, Honda, um, uh, I don't know what it's called. I did read it somewhere once. Let me see if I can show you better on another one here. Honda has, or Honda uses rather, this reddish, dark reddish color sealer when they put these um, uh, O-rings in for the float bolt. And I don't know if I'm going to need one any uh, when I put these in because you can see they're round. They're not. They're not form fitted. So I'm not really sure what material they use for this, and, and I'm unsure of whether or not I'm going to have to use something to hold these in. You really want to stay away from that. It is impossible to lay in some sealer uh, and stick an O-ring in and then put it up in a carburetor without at least a little bit getting on the inside, and then that breaks loose, and you have the same problem with your with your uh, pilot jets, the small circuits in the carburetor. Stay away from it. So Wahanda uses this stuff, and it's sometimes a bitch to get out. But we'll, what will take it out generally and dissolve it is carb cleaner. So if you just soak that O-ring slot, that groove, with carb cleaner, kind of let this, you know, sit this up level as possible. Fill that up. Just keep doing it. Come back with even a little piece of plastic. Most of that shit will just come right out. I have not done these yet, but that's what I will do. Now, the red-eye kit actually goes as far as providing a little piece of nice flat plexiglass. And what they want you to do, what he wants you to do rather, is once these things are totally clean, you take and put your drain screw back in with a new O-ring and then tighten it up all the way, or just snug it, I should say. Then you put your O-ring on the float bolt. Then you take this piece of plastic and you gotta kinda, this one is, is designed for the Valkyrie carb, so we could use it, but we'd have to cut it. But you get an idea. You cover the O-ring surface on the float bowl and seal it off with this piece of plexiglass. Then you take a vacuum pump and you hook it up to the drain. Then you crack the drain you pull a vacuum on it and make sure it seals, it holds. If it holds, then it's a good fit regarding the O-ring to the um, float bowl and it's going to seal off fine. Now again, this one is, is not designed for this, okay? It's not going to fit exactly right. I can make it fit, I just have to cut it down a little narrower but it's not designed for this. So, but I just wanted to show you to illustrate how, uh, how some, you know, some steps need to be taken to absolutely verify they're not going to leak. Otherwise, uh, you, uh, you know, you got to take it back out again. What I do to verify these is once the rack is all together, um, I will set it down probably right here, put a towel out just in case, and I will feed some fuel to it at gravity with my auxiliary fuel can and fill all the carburetors up and let it sit for about 15 or 20 minutes. And if I don't have any drips coming anywhere, then I call it good. I also do a pressure test on the rack. Um, I doubt I will show you that in this video because I have a video on that. It's in an inline four rack, but it's the same thing. And so I will pressure test this rack upside down, which puts the weight of the floats down on the float valve and float needle and seat. And I can put four or five PSI and if it holds, it tests not only those, but it tests the integrity of the fuel tees and the fuel hose. And you, again, you can get an idea how this one goes here, all right? Because uh, this is the fuel line. And, and uh, you know, that's what we have these for from the Before Dreams kit. Now, speaking of fuel tees, um, these plastic fuel tees on these old carburetors are extremely fragile. And you, they're going to crack. The first time you put a little bit of extra pressure on them, they're going to crack. It's inevitable. So if you can find a metal alternative for the carburetor rack you're working on, then I would highly recommend that. And I did find some on eBay. They're quite plentiful for the VFR, a wide range of years. And I've ordered a aluminum fuel T kit that comes with O-rings. And that's what I mentioned before. I said I may or may not use these because the T's that I am getting come with O-rings. So I'll look at those O-rings and if they look like shit, then I'll just use these because I know these are good. And I probably will anyway. But So, yeah. So, that's why I am going with that as far as the T's go. Now, last thing I want to cover is the actual carb bodies. 
Now, when you ultrasonically clean one of these or you go through it very carefully with carb clean and so forth, the last thing you want to do is you want to make sure and verify, and I mean 100% verify, that every passage, every channel is clear in this carburetor. And how you do that is with the carb clean. You want to see it go in one and out the other. A lot of people forget the back side or the intake side of the carburetors. This is an air jet, uh, I believe is for the mains. Now you can also, a lot of times, look at this carburetor and trace the circuit by just looking at the features of how it is cast. Like for example, let's see if we can find one. Yes, take a look at this. So here is the enricher port. This is where the enricher plunger goes, right? So let's see where this thing goes to. So this is the side that where the screws in and the plunger goes in and out and it opens up. So what does it do when it opens up? It, it opens up a channel in here. There's the circuit right there. That channel goes down, goes into there. Okay. Go, so you can see that, right? It goes from here. I'm sorry, from where is it again? It goes from here. There's the inside channel there. Right there and right there. So zoom, zoom, zoom. And now we flip it around. And you see where it picks up? It picks up right there. Kind of hard to see. I'm going to try to get you a little bit better light there. It picks up right there. Remember, it was on the back side here. It goes through. And what's behind there is that. And you can see that runs right down to the enricher circuit, or the enricher jet, I should say. That's the beginning of the enricher circuit where it's going to draw fuel up. And this is that fixed jet I mentioned before. So let's trace it back the other way. So the fuel goes in, comes up, goes through this part of the tube here, this circuit, goes over a little bit, comes up through here, goes up through here. This is the other end of this little chamber where that uh, where that screws into, and so that's how that works. You can look at these carburetors and get a really good idea where these circuits are. So when you put um, you know a spray of carb clean in here, make sure you wear your safety squint so you don't go blind. It's going to come out here. It also may come out here because this is a shared circuit because this is where the air is going to get picked up for it to operate because you're changing the vacuum dynamics. So when that plunger opens up, it's got to get some sort of air coming through somewhere and it's picking it up from up top here, all right, which is really just part of the uh, the whole top of the chamber here, which is vented. Yes, okay, this is vented. This is the main carb vent. It comes up into this diaphragm area, as you can see. And so it's going to get some air from here when it opens up and the Venturi effect is going to run down the circuit we already discussed and pull up the fuel right here. So that just goes to show that you can kind of reverse engineer these things to ensure that when you blow them out, all those circuits are clean. But again, don't forget those. Don't forget any holes up here. Don't forget any other jets, you know, jet holes. Uh, don't forget your regular fuel intake inlet, rather. Make sure that's all clean. And of course, your air jets on the back of the carburetor. Don't forget them. Now, I originally thought on this um, uh, job, on this project, that I'd probably film some of the carbs going back together. Especially after what I've just shown you, you probably don't need to see that. Because it's just a matter of screwing everything in, putting it tight, but not too tight. You don't want to over tight jets and snap them off. I have had jets where half the little screw part has been broken and I've had jets that are recessed in on some Makinis that were like that and I had to make a special tool to go in there and get them out which luckily I was able to. So you don't want to over tighten them. I can't give you a torque reading on them. I just put you know whatever I feel is good on it you know as far as torquing them up with a screwdriver and make sure you use the right size screwdriver. Even a vessel like this is a little bit too big for the smaller slow jets. So I'm going to use, I have a special screwdriver I like to use for these, special. And we'll tighten those up and uh, get it all back together. Uh, same thing with the, uh, when you put the, you know, when these removable float seat jobs, we want to make sure that that gasket's in there. It's easy to forget. And you know, what's going to happen if there's no gasket there is the fuel coming in will bypass around those threads and it'll, it'll act as if you have a float that's not sealing. It will definitely overflow your carb. So, yeah, that's important. If you do have a carburetor that has the O-ring type that slips in and has a little retainer or a screw next to it, 
always, always, always replace those O-rings. They will fail. It is 100% certain it'll fail. Take it to the bank. But in this case, we're going to screw a new one in with a new washer. You can see it kind of right there. And we'll be done. So I'm not going to film any putting these back together. Um, I will um, just pick it up and show you in one video or another when the rack's all back together and, and uh, show you what it came out, how it came out, I should say, and maybe any, any things about that. But that's about it. Just wanted to cover that stuff. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Hope you got something out of it. Subscribe, ring the bell, like the video. You know the drill. It doesn't cost you a dime, and it helps yours truly out immensely. All right, folks, they're all back together, and I actually have this video already edited it in the can ready for upload, but I'm going to go ahead and re-edit it and add this segment into the end because it kind of really highlights and emphasizes what I've told you about as far as aftermarket kits go in this video. So come on closer, and I'll show you what I mean. We'll call this a summary or wrap-up prior to the outro, okay, because I need to show you this stuff. It's pretty important. All right, so I have the carb rack upside down, and that's number two that I just unscrewed the screws from. And you didn't even see that because I was so fast and took the float bowl cover or the float bowl off itself. All right, so here's number one lesson. Never trust aftermarket parts. Even when they have this on it that says they're for that, don't trust them. Always be suspect, and you have to test, test, and retest, okay? Here's what I found. Right here is a box O parts or a tray O parts, and this is pretty much the entire contents of each one of these aftermarket parts. The only thing I ended up using was that little old crush washer that came with it to seal up the valve seat, the float valve seat. These float valve seats, okay, with the float needles that came with them, would not seal up at all. I put them in. Put the floats in, set the float heights to the service manual, and then I put my pressure tester on it, which I'll show you here in a sec, and I couldn't build any pressure at all, and it was just blown right by these. Okay, it just did, they just did not work. Don't know why, they just don't. And again, this is what came with. But before that, <laughs> before that, I noticed that the slow jets didn't want to screw into the car bodies that well. Plus, these are called bleed slow jets, bleed jets. They have small little holes in them. The holes in the ones that came out of the car, which I think are original, or at least OEM, uh, are bigger. And these just didn't seat right. I think they were slightly longer, and it was actually crushing the end here a little bit. They just didn't feel right. So I aborted that. Then, after I saw the problem with not only that slow jet, but the problem with the floats, I had installed the 118 main jet with the aftermarket emulsion, and I said, two things that are bad in a kit are too much, and I'm going to abort and not use any of that except for that one thing I said before, that crush washer. So it's got the same main jets and the same pilot jets. Everything was clean, and I double-checked that, that I took it apart with, and it was running fine with those before. So again, don't trust aftermarket parts. Um, these are not going to go to waste. Trust me, I'll find some use for them. And you might say, well, if they don't work here, then it won't work somewhere else. That's not true. Because in some situations, depending on how much weight the float is putting on when you're in testing mode, or even when it's pressed on by fuel, it, would, it may work. It also may work with a different float valve. You know, I might be able to replace a seat that's corroded uh, in a particular car, but that these happen to fit and then get it going again. I'll use them somewhere, okay? I, I will, or I'll certainly pop off the little filters and use them somewhere. So I'm, it's not going to go to waste, and these O-rings can, um, these are float bowl O-rings. I'll use them somewhere, like I said. So again, number one, don't trust aftermarket uh, kits. If you just throw them into carbs, especially these multi-carbs, and expect them to work, don't be, uh, you know, don't be too surprised when they don't, because a lot of times they don't. Okay, number two thing to remember is, again, test, test, test. You have to test everything when you're rebuilding carbs. These are too complicated, and they are too much of a bitch to get out and back in, and then out and back in if you need to do it a second time, to get it wrong even once. Because you turn them over, you put fuel to them while it's on the bike, it pisses fuel everywhere, you don't even know where it's coming from. So you definitely want to test. How I do that, and I have a video on this, but I'll show you real quick, is I have a blood pressure homemade 
testing rig to pressurize um, the uh, fuel system from where it attaches, which I'm doing right now, to the T in this case, because there are two fuel lines that go from a T to so it bifurcates out to two, and then it goes to each one of these fuel joints. Here's one of the old fuel joints here. I replaced the fuel joints with metal ones, and I took the Viton O-rings that came from the V4 Dream Kit um, that was for essentially to put back on here, and I put them on there. I took the O-rings off that those came with and put those on, only because I wanted to. So then once you're hooked up to your pressure tester, is I pressure test it, and like I said earlier, when I did this and pumped it up, I could not build any pressure, and I mean zero, none, nada. It just came out like there was no float valve in one or all of the carburetors. And I traced it down right, you know, once I took the float, I had already had the float bolts put on and everything. I took them back off and saw it was float valve. So what I do with these is I pump up to about 5 PSI usually, and this is just a garden variety pressure slash vacuum gauge. And it'll settle down a little bit as the, as the uh, Velcro and this thing kind of releases a little bit because I use this because it's an accumulator. It keeps pressure going. See, watch the gauge. If I squeeze this, it'll fluctuate the gauge a little bit. Oh, you can't see that. It'll fluctuate the gauge a little bit. So this is constantly providing pressure. That's why I like to use it, because going directly is the only pressure you're going to have is really in here. Actually, it's not. This is a check valve. There won't be any pressure, and this is one way. The only pressure would be in the lines, so that isn't enough. You need something that's got some pressure behind it, because otherwise you won't see any decay. There's no pressure behind it to really decay. Now, you will get a certain amount of decay on some carburetor racks like this over a period of time. I don't know why. But keep in mind that the carburetors are designed to restrain, or at least the float system designed to restrain fuel, not air. This one's holding pretty well. Uh, but it comes it goes down to about four and then stops. And that could be, again, just a little bit of stretch here or what have you. But anyway, this passes a pressure test, which it would not do with the other parts. And so there's, there's the two things again. Number one, don't trust them, which I didn't because I pressure tested. Number two, test, 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 which I've been doing. So the flow heights are all set correctly according to the service manual, and I have basically all the original parts except for these float valves, which are the ones I got. These are 188953s, K&Ls, made in Japan, right there, that uh, the gentleman from v4dreams.com, he didn't sell them to me because he didn't have any, but he said get this number and those are the ones that fit this. So that's why, and I mentioned in the video, I kind of duplicate parts sometimes because I don't trust all, you know, I don't want to put my eggs in one basket when it comes to after, aftermarket parts. So I, I've used K&L stuff before and I've had no problems with it. So these are ultimately, I had this pack of six and I ultimately use four of those. And that's what you see in these carbs right here. So again, that's uh, 188953 is the part number, K&L part number for v, uh, VFR 750 at least this year range, you know, the, the first gen, I guess. I don't know if it's all of them or not. So, yeah. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you was, and I already told you I got the um, I got the metal fuel tees on here, but I am going to, or fuel joints. Let me show you something else here. I want to put an O-ring back on this one. I mentioned in the video about taking these O-rings off, whether you're scraping them out of a float bowl. This one's got a brand new Viton in there, so I'm not going to touch it. But to try to get these float bowls, uh, these float bowl O-rings out, you got to get underneath them with something and peel them out. You generally don't want to use a metal tool because if you gouge that or scratch it, there's a leak potential. Same thing with the fuel tees, fuel joints. If you're going to reuse these, um, you're going to have to get that O-ring off of there. Now what you can do is you can get a, a plastic tool like this is essentially a homemade pick tool for it. If you pick up a pack of these um, little brushes, like at the grocery store, that you'd give your kids to do watercolors with, and I have a pack of these on hand all the time because I use them for spreading little bits of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, gasket sealer or whatever if I'm doing something like that, and other purposes too. You just take a file and you just file the tip down. It's a sturdy plastic. And it'll work really good for this, and it won't scratch anything up or gouge anything. So you can kind of get in here and give it a push and get underneath it. It'll kind of start to scrunch it up. See what I'm saying? You'll start to scrunch it up. Whoops, I lost it there. And once you start scrunching it up, 
These old ones, the stiff ones, are difficult. Once you start scrunching it up, you can usually use your thumb and get it over the edge like that. There you go. And so now it comes off. The other thing that I use, and it works pretty well, to do the same exact thing is a coffee stirrer, a regular wooden coffee stirrer. Now, the plastic works better on these old dried-out O-rings. The, the nicer the O-ring that you're going to replace, the better these work with. But you can do the same thing. You essentially come in here and kind of dig into the O-ring a little bit. And you see it's kind of giving you some, it's scrunching up like the other one. Then you bring your thumb in and voila, it's out. And we didn't touch any of that inside part with a sharp tool. So I mentioned not using the sharp tools in the video, but I really didn't show you an alternative. Then I figured I would. Oh, I almost forgot. I wanted to tell you how I handled the um, those four and a half millimeter plugs that go on various parts of the carburetors. Uh, there's one there. I ended up making the plugs um, with a little piece of brass that I turned down with a little shoulder. Let me zoom up on a little bit. And this is actually Honda 4.5 millimeter fuel line. This is good fuel lines, not the cheap crap from, you know, dormant crap fuel line. And then I stuck the uh, brass, little, it's just a little shorty thing, and glued it in there with some super glue. That will not go anywhere. It's tight in there anyway, the brass that is, and then I just slipped these on once that was dry. This will be a fine pressure cap, a vacuum cap, whatever you want to call it, uh, because, um, you know, it's just a cap to, to close those off. I don't really know exactly why they have them, but, um, you know, maybe the carburetor is used in other applications. So, pop one off here and show you a little bit closer. So, it's just a little cap that I made for it, and that's just going to be just fine. It's the right size, and again, that Honda fuel line is good stuff. So, until next time, guys, always remember, well, first of all, thanks for watching. Then, always remember, don't just repair, restore. Catch you on the next video.